Good afternoon, I am Pete, also known as Risk for Awards, or over on Twitter, known as at Risk for Awards. Currently got around over 20,000 followers over there, um, and around just under 2,000 here on YouTube now, on the subscription. So if you haven't subscribed, if you want to click the link, that'd be perfect. Just means that as soon as my videos go live, you get them straight away, especially with, I'm going to be fairly quiet over Twitter over the next month or so anyway, so I'm probably going to do a few more videos here that may not relate straight to the weekend's racing, but more to towards anti-post betting or just a few things that I do from my experiences. I'm not here to stand here and educate everyone, but I am going to share a few things that I do to help myself win a few pounds here and there. Um, so, and that's what today's video is about. It's um, about a little bit about anti-post punting. Um, next two weeks are fairly quiet on the um, on the betting front generally and also on the horse racing front. I know obviously we have got, there's a fa fairly good card over in Ireland. Um, but it's a good time that most people, I think, take a break before they go into the summer for like Goodwood and stuff like that. Uh, me, myself, I'm personally, I'm taking around six weeks where I'm not going to be producing as much content. So I might do the odd video here and there. And if you see a selection on YouTube, it'll probably just be a selection with a few sentences. I'm not suddenly just not following racing anymore. It's just... Uh, each year I've over the last two years I've took August off and by taking August off and, and that's not me just going away from racing altogether I still watch racing all the time I love racing just like you watching the football on a Saturday I'll still watch it all um, you just step out the ring from the betting side of things you stop looking at the anti posts on the Tuesday on the Monday morning ready for the weekend looking at the decks on the Thursday afternoon um, it just gives your brain a break I know a lot of people think oh yeah well it, it can't be that bad sort of thing but I do live eat sleep racing and as in I look at every prices I'm looking as they go up looking at the decks i'll be studying races as soon as they go up any time that i can get i just I, it's very difficult for me to switch off so by me being able to take the six weeks off um and just have a little bit of a breather and stuff and um, then come back towards september time just means you come back for the best part of the flat season you also come back um ready for obviously the jumps and more importantly obviously the anti-post side of the jumps the reason september is so important is one because obviously it's a lot of good, good group ones um on the flat um, and you've got a decent amount of form um, and two obviously the uh, all the stable tours do begin to come out from October time obviously we got news from Barry Connell the other day the last thing I want to miss is a price and the last thing I want to miss is sharing a price so that's, that's the plan for me um, um, with regards to Discord so people are still messaging me on Twitter I'm not in the Discord anymore so anyone who's messaging me saying I can't do this I can't do that like it's not for me to tell you how to do things anymore because I can't access it you have to contact the guys Algo and NTN you contact those and they'll be able to sort you out and help you out to um, get you to where you need to be with regards to the Discord as I said I'm taking a break from it all taking a step back and I'm having a summer at the end of the day if you win money in March um, obviously some people do some people don't if you win money at Cheltenham I don't want to just spend it all by sitting in and not seeing, like obviously going outside, having beers, meeting the family, friends, going to parties and enjoying it. So as I said, not switching off from racing completely, but just having a break, taking a bit of a breather. So if you see my selections and they, they are short, it doesn't mean I've just got lazy. It, I still will have studied that selection. It just means I'm not putting as much content because I just don't want to take the time and sit there and do it for hours and hours because I do it for the other 11 months of the year. So anyway, like no one cares. Um, quick recap on just last week. I'm just going to go into something not generally result by result. Um, it's just something that I've noticed and a lot of people, obviously I don't know how people are punting this stuff and how there's not many people I know that where they're having the best flat season. Mainly because I think the first four, four to six weeks of it, a lot of it was still on a mixture of heavy ground, like things like the guineas. The ground was very, and then we just spun. Going into Royal Ascot, it went good to firm. So the form books went out the window. The form wasn't there regardless of Ascot. And I'm seeing a lot of, not so much the form as new market wasn't so bad, but the movement for the market was very, very strong. And I don't know whether it's people, there's big punters coming in who have maybe lost a few quid over six weeks um, and they're, they're hitting markets harder or whether it's just there are really strong fancies and they're still not coming off. Like you look at Tower of London, that was nine to four opening, um, went off four to six, absolutely punted off the boards. And obviously, Ryan Moore doesn't give him any bad rides and he didn't give this horse a bad ride but he dropped his whip if he hadn't dropped his whip he would have won that race and it's just one of those that goes astray and you saw some of the market moves obviously some pay off like the likes of Nostrum and City of Troy but as I've said obviously with that um, the same with that uh, Adiar Adiar was very strong at one to three despite many people being against Adiar um, under the circumstances for the faster ground I just think he's a bit of a boat now he's had his time um, and he's just not a horse. But obviously, again, the Star of Mystery was uh, one, to, one to three. There wasn't a lot between Star of Mystery and Persian Dreamer. Sent off one to six and beaten. So 
I'm not here to tell you what to do. All I'm saying is every now and again, I'm taking a breather personally and it doesn't it doesn't hurt anyone to just have a little bit of a breath and say, oh, right, let's go again and wait. It just makes you hungrier, to be honest. It just makes you study harder. You just enjoy it more. Um, and at the end of the day, do you really want to sit in all the time when it's sunny outside? I don't personally. Um, right, so anyway, on to, let's not go through all the results. Um, let's go straight on to why we're here. So I'm doing a video a little bit differently. The reason I'm doing it is because no one else does these sort of things. Um, something that when I came to Twitter, I wanted to know all about why do people do these? Why do that? Why do I look around and everyone's like, oh yeah, I've got it at this price. I've got this horse at this price. Why is this and stuff? And um, and I was like, I don't know how to learn. I don't know who to ask. And you ask around and some people will share certain things with you, but they won't give it you all because at the end of the day, they don't want to give away theirs. But what I found is... As long as, depending on who, obviously, who you give it to, I have found that certain times if you give it to the wrong people, then obviously you do lose the price because they'll hit it a lot harder than you'd want them to. But generally, if you, it does, it pays nothing to share once you've got your own bet on, whether it's sharing information of why you backed that horse or sharing a time of I'm backing it at this time. And obviously, over the last few years, over the last five years, everything I've put, I've backed for, whether it's festivals or big, like the Grand National or big events or derbies and stuff, I generally put it on Twitter and then it's just meant that people have managed to get it. And it was the same with the Discord. Over the weekend, it got shared into the Discord prices. You might want to back this for the derbies, stuff like that. And then and then people just get their prices. Once you've got your bet on, I mean, unless you're planning to plow into that over a long period, it's a, it costs nothing to share. And that's why I'm trying to do these videos. So I'm going to just go through a few pointers. I've picked out only... Six six pointers. I'm going to keep them as short as possible, um, and I'm just going to go into as a small amount as possible because I could literally do a four stage video, probably an hour long on each of anti post betting. But I don't want to do that. I want to try and keep it short, sharp, and just share a little bit today. So why anti post? For me personally, it's the simple: the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And what I mean by that is that. If you can afford to wait until the day, you get a lot more things in your favour. So you'll get, you'll know what the ground is, the field is, the draw is, everything's in your favour. But unless you're sat there with a lot of money, it's very difficult for you to be making half decent amounts of money. What I mean is, if you want to wait there until, like, say, I don't know, on the weekend with City of Troy, if you want to wait until Coolmore have had their money down at four to six, and you say, now everything's in my favour, and you're sat there with like six grand, okay, bang, you make your four grand, that's perfect. And you're like, and that's fine if you've got a lot of money and that is how you want to play the game. But for, I'm not going to say nine out of ten because I don't know the percentages, but for a lot of people in the game, they're not betting that sort of money, but they still would like to win a decent amount of money. So you could have took, say, that horse at, say, 13 to 8, which you're putting, say you put £2 on. That's making you £3.25 profit. But the guys that are putting on at £2, they're getting, well, 66, 66, so £1.40, £1. £1.30 profit on the day instead. So you're, you're losing almost a point by going that later. You've got all that extra stuff. Sorry, that's completely wrong. So points, 66, 66, one pound 30-ish. So to three pound, you're losing nearly two points. So you're losing two points, 3.25 profit to about, um, yeah, about 1.3. And you're losing almost two points profit. So some people might say, okay, well, for two quid, that's not the biggest amount. But whether you're betting two pound or whether you're betting 2,000 pounds, if you put 2,000 pound on at six to four, you're getting 5,250. You put 2,000 on at, say, four to six on, you're getting about 3,300 back. The, the, the difference is massive. And, that, and that's obviously just, this is me just talking about antipost flat from the difference between betting on a Thursday to the difference between betting on a Saturday. The only difference that you had, because the draws would have been out, the jockey bookings would have been out, you would have known everything else. The only thing you'd be waiting on is the ground. You already know that you get your money back if he's a runner. So why are you waiting? They're waiting because they want to know that that money's going down. And that's fine for people who have got that sort of a betting bank. And if it doesn't go right, so like with Tower of London, they waited, the money came, and that didn't go right. So you've got to make sure that you, if you're back in four to six shots, that you've got that betting bank ready to go. Whereas for not saying nine out of ten again but for a lot of people they don't want to do that so this is why you look at anti-post pay whether it's on the thursday on the flat whether like today you've got the entries for the uh irish oaks and stuff on the saturday a lot of people will be looking at entries they might take prices now if they think say i don't know save the last dance or warm heart isn't going to run or they may wait till thursday because they want to wait and see the market but it's having your opportunities to go there so they can afford to, the bigger punters can afford to wait if they've got a betting bank of that big. The differences between smaller punters is the fact that, and I'll refer this to a longer, longer term bets. 
is that it gives you an opportunity that you're not just betting for a week's time. You're betting for, say, a month's time, two months' time, three months' time. So, like, say, I don't know, say today I've picked a horse and it's six to one to win the King George. And we are obviously on 18th of July. So we're looking at five months to the King George. So you pick a horse and it's eight to one. Your opportunity is not just that you can back that horse now, so say have a five pound on that horse now. You've now got eight months to decide, yeah, I still like that horse. I'm going to have a free bet on it. I still like it again. I'm going to have a free bet on it. I still like it again. I'm going to put it in a small roll-up bet. And, I, and, and it allows you the opportunity to build and build and build. So come the day, you've got a lot more money on that horse, or you haven't got a lot more money. You've got a lot more free bets, but you're due to return a lot more. And that's the difference between obviously the anti-post and the non-anti-post and also the difference between there is a massive difference between taking a six to four shot or again just going back to Thursday nine to four that Tower of London went off four to six if you're that one step ahead if you already know you're going to back Tower of London then you take that price then it means that you're not getting stung with the you're having 10 pound on you're getting 32.50 back you have 10 pound on at four to six you're getting 16 pound 66 back that is pretty much like not null and void, but it's just such a big swing. It just means you can afford to be losing. You only have to hit one every two and a bit um, at the bigger prices. And that's my point is the fact that anti-post, people see anti-post and they think, oh, anti-post is dead. You can't bet anti-post. But that's not true at all. You just need to plan as far ahead as you can. So, and on the flat, it's very different to the jump. So on the flat, you currently, you could plan 48 hours in advance. So if I look at the markets now, and this is why I'm taking a break, because obviously I could be looking at the markets now, I see who's entered. I can start looking at those cards. And then as soon as the prices are released on Thursday, the decks are made, the prices will come out around between probably 11 and 2 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. I could take all the prices that I'd like to and those markets. They'll be raw. They'll be set up by the traders. They won't have had a chance to look and compare our William Hill against Bet365. Obviously, they do to some extent, but there's always going to be someone who's got to go up first. If you take those prices early, you're getting those prices. And OK, yeah, sometimes it doesn't go your way. Of course, that's, that's always going to be the case. But you could get a 25 to 1 shot that goes off at 8 to 1. And sometimes they'll win, sometimes they'll lose. But the difference is you're getting those extra prices. If you can afford to wait until two minutes before the race because you've got a better, bigger bank, you want everything input wise. The only difference is, is the fact that you've got to have that opinion. So as in whether it's you're following someone who you know is a fairly good judge or you as a person are a fairly good judge. Because obviously you're when you're betting on a Thursday afternoon for a Saturday race, you don't have anyone else's influence. You're not reading the race in post. You're not looking at a tipster. You're not listening to podcasts, videos, looking at you can look at weather forecasts. You'll have a draw, but you've got to trust your own instincts. So. It, I just all I'm getting at is the fact that there is opportunities everywhere so for those who don't obviously know about that you get the entries will come out on a Tuesday morning for the Saturdays Saturdays racing and then on a Thursday you will get the declarations will start running through 48 hours before you can track them on the website and it will, it will show you and you'll just see them entered not entered and stuff and that's 48 hours before that's Thursday morning on the BHA website or obviously in Ireland it'll be they'll be released later on the day but it's through IRHB um and then later later on um, in that day and Thursday afternoon, you can take whatever prices you want straight away. And so I know everyone associates anti post with long ways away, but you you could have a look if you want if you really want to have a look look on Thursday afternoon. Look at the prices of the Newbury card. Just take a screenshot of all the different races and then have a look at those races five minutes before. They will be so different. So all I'm saying is that anti post isn't just all, all about long term, but it is about if you're a punter who doesn't have that massive betting bank or you just want to generate more profit and you've got trust in what obviously yourself or whoever you're following, it's just an opportunity to win more money. Which leads me straight on to my next point, which is quite a simple one. So point number two is a six to one shot pays the same tonight at Wolverhampton as it does at the Cheltenham Festival. On paper. 100% agree. Obviously, you cannot physically disagree with that statement. However, we all know that is not true. For those who don't any post punt, the reason that is not true is because over the course of the period of however long you've decided to back that six to one shot, just like as I've just mentioned, it offers opportunity. So the first time I made over a thousand pounds was when I thought Forheen was an absolute certainty to win the champion hurdle on his first attempt. I didn't know, like, I wasn't like, I, I was massively into racing, but I, I wasn't the best judge in the world. But I'd just seen it and I thought, there is no way that he won't win the champion hurdle. At the time, Skybet were offering £10 free bet every Monday. So 
there was zero thought process to it. Every single Monday without fail, bang, ten pound on, ten pound on, ten pound on. And obviously the five to one went, and then the four to one, and it got shorter and it shorter. Um, but then come the festival, and obviously I'd I had my what I call my starter bet. So I'd had a bet on it at five to one, and then all I did was just do that the whole way through. It wasn't like oh I'm going to try and be clever and double it up with this or treble it up with that. I just disciplined straight into that, bang bang bang. And it was the first time I ever won a thousand pound over a thousand pounds in a race. Um, and so people will look at it and people will be like, oh, why is everyone booming a four to seven shot or a one to two shot? And that's why, because you've had the strategy, you've had the planning to be able to plan it out. And this is the difference between people who can bet every day. So like me, I couldn't even tell you what racing was on today. I will look through the night before because I want to check to see if there's any horses, like any meetings or any horses that are running that could affect further down markets. But generally, if I look through and I'm like Wolverhampton and stuff like that, I just literally just switch off. There's no need, no reason for me to go through them all. Um, but these by, by getting these early prices, it allows you to stake less but win more. And it also reduces your loss. If I turn up on the day and I think for him was a certainty six months ago and I turn up on the day and he's one to two and I'm like and I'm on to win a thousand pounds. That means I've got to stake two thousand pounds to win that one thousand profit. Does everyone have two thousand pounds that they want to risk on that sort of bet when they can do it over a prolonged period? The other beauty of it is the fact that you don't have to stay tuned into racing every single day. You can literally be like, right, OK, I've got Wednesday off work. Let's have a look through. OK, I'm going to have a look through the odds checker anti-post markets. I'm going to have a look through the anti-post markets for the Cheltenham Festival. I'm going to have a look for the anti-post markets for the Grand National. And you can place your bet and then you can be like, OK, right, next time I've got a horse I like, I'm going to pair it with that horse. And, and it's just there's so much opportunity. You don't have to rush a bet. You could be like, do you know what? I think, I don't know, Innsbruck is going to win some race at three to one in three weeks time and you're like right she's going to win that race so that was a really bad example because i don't think it's going to win but it's that's just a complete example um so she i and you're like i'm going to double her with whatever the horse was that you've seen in the distance and you're like oh yeah that's brilliant now i've got obviously i've got my money back since bro one but i also had a small bet on that and now i've got that going for me as well and it just gives you the opportunity to plan. And you don't have to, you can go to work for a week or week and you're like, oh yeah, it doesn't make any odds to me. You've, you've placed your bet for that. You can add to it on the Monday. The zero thought process once you've concentrated on that race. And most of the time, if that horse goes non-runner, so like I've also, when I remember back in 14, a good example again, when I had, I was on for similar, but probably more returns, but using a lot of the free money again um, in my early days, but he got injured in like the January time. And I was like, oh, that's really disappointing. Because obviously it was a big amount of money to me at the time. But at the same time, because I'd used so much planning, used all the free bets, used small bets, waited for the right bet to pair with him and stuff like that. It was, there was a little amount of loss. So the, it has its highs and lows, but I just think that it allows people to be able to, it allows the little guy to be able to win a few quid by planning. It, it just means you plan. If you take the time to plan, you can win. And you can win more money, in my opinion, than what someone who goes there, they might go there with a 50 grand pot and they go around there smacking on all the favourites or and they've got everything in their favour as an in information wise. But you've plotted yours out. It just reduces the loss and increases the profits. So as much as six to one, six to one does pay the same. When people say that, I understand what they're saying. As you can see, it's not it's not a clean cut like that. Um, so number three. Right, so points, so point system. So I used an example, obviously, when I was um, talking through the Cheltenham results from my last, I think it was three or four years, I used the points. So the year of COVID, I had 100 plus points profit if you just put one point on every every horse anti-post for the Cheltenham Festival. Um, so people would be like, oh, that's brilliant. If I had like a tenner on, that's a thousand pounds. If you had a hundred quid on, that's 10 grand. That's brilliant, like really good results and stuff. Um, and that was a bumper year, like as in that as that it was the best year I've ever had. But it doesn't always correlate like that. And what I mean by that is the fact that depending on the type of punter it is, is that should you really have all of your points? Should it really be that when you come to the race that the horse with the biggest price is the one that rewards you most, if that makes sense? So you may have backed a horse at 33 to 1, but you may also have backed a 9 to 1 and a 5 to 1 shot. So you've got two you've got two ways of playing it. Me personally in my early days, I'd just be like, right, okay, I'm gonna have like say two pound on that, two pound on that, two pound on that. And th that would be how it was. And then if the horse 
if the horse wins, obviously at the biggest price, that's the one I'm making the biggest profit. However, I've changed that. This is why I know obviously everyone loves point systems and stuff, but I've changed that. I will put a base bet down. So what I mean is if I like a price of a horse, so say I think a horse is going to win, let's use the Arkle from this year. So John Bond was say five to one, um, El Fabiolo say nine to one and Dice Up Dynamo 19 to one. So originally you put your base bet down. So I'm like, right, okay, I'm going to have say 10 pounds on each of those. That means, right, I'm on for 50 pound for John Bond, um, 100 pounds for El Fabiolo and 200 pounds for Dice Up Dynamo. Yeah, but which one do you fancy the most? Well, John Bon at the current time. Oh, okay. Well, and then who? El Fabiolo. Oh, okay. Well, why is why are you winning the most amount of money on um, the on the outside on Dice Up Dynamo? Well, because he was the biggest price. So it may look pretty on a stats thing if you obviously you're getting the ninety to one and stuff. But generally, me personally, I'll build that base. So I'd get say right instead of doing it that that way where I've obviously just described it where you just put the same amount on each horse. I will pick a number. So I'm not going to stand here because I don't want to put numbers in people's heads. But say for complete random example is say you wanted to win this 27 or 28 races at the Channel Festival. Say you decided your number was £50. That means instead of doing it where you put in £1, £1, £1, you back whatever amount you need to in order to return £50. So on John Bond, say he was 4 to 1, say £10 on John Bond say £5 on El Fabiolo, and then £2.50 on um, Dice Up Dynamo. And you're like, right, I've got my base, £50. Okay, so that's you left. Like, yes, and it doesn't matter like what the prices were or anything like that. If any of those three horses then win that race, you're getting returns of the same amount. And then once you've got that base, so that's the sort of thing that I'd start to do. And then once you've got that base, you work out who you think is the most likely winner, who you expect to win. And then you can start moving up and down, depending on how you want to stake things and move. And, oh, John Bond's beat this horse. I think that'll be the price. He's coming out first. Oh, the vibes are good. And then you start moving around. And then you start putting your prices of how you'd like to be. That's the easiest way that I've always found it, is that you find your base. So you find how much you'd like to win in a race. And you find how much you'd like to win if any of those win. And then work out which one is the most likely winner. So by the time it came to the festival, mine was obviously, obviously it's easy to say now, but it, mine was obviously El Fabiolo and John Bomb were here and Dice Up Dynamo was, it was pretty much a cover bet. It would have won, it would have given me profit. But at the start, at the very start, when I took the prices, they were all the same. But then as I got close to the season, I was like, right, okay, John Bond's got his debut. So right, I need to top up here and I will pack him to, for there. And then, oh, El Fabio is out next. Okay, I'll put him there. And, and it, you arrange them. And then you're like, right, I'm going to leave Dice at Dynamo where he is and see how he gets on. And then so you're like, okay, I, I thought that was good. The other two are better. And then you can leave that there. And then you're like, right. So whatever happens, you are set to say win £50. So as long as you've not staked more than £50 going up to the festival, um, then you'll always win your money back minimum from your outsider of the three. And then obviously the other two, you win more and more and more. So I don't know if that's making sense. Hopefully it's making sense to some people. What I'm trying to say, the bottom line is, for me personally, it's about trying to win a set amount of money first. Over the course of 28, 28 races, If whatever your goal is, if you were there to win, say, £50 a race, and you're a small stakes punter, so you normally bet two, three, four, five pound a race, um, and your goal is to win £50 a race, like, if you manage to get, like, I'm not saying, obviously, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but on average, normally I aim to get around 50, I, oh, I don't aim to get around, obviously I want every winner, but I normally get around 50% of the races at the Charlton Festival, so 50% winners, like 12, 13 minimum. So if you got that and you were at £50 per race, then I mean, that's, that's you already made £600. And if you're used to putting two or three pound on a horse, and the other way as well is what you've got to think is that you can always put very, very, you don't even have to put cash on. Say if you were covering Dice of Dynamo, again, back to my free bets, 90 to one, five pound free bet, bang. I don't fancy him that strongly, but he's got a good chance that he could win. I'll back the other two only, and I'll just free bet him, get a couple in. Right, that's him locked in. He will cover any stake I've got, and then I can do that. you just got to remember, obviously, I'm not lucky enough because of my accounts now that I get free bets like many people, but I know a lot of punters do. So it's just how you redistribute them. So on to number four. So point four is price, which is value versus realistic probability. So me personally, this is where I like the way I play. Other people will like the way they play. And what I mean by this is some people will play at the top end of the market, as in the, 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 the bigger end of the market. 
So the end where you're back in 50 to 1 shots that you think should be 25 to 1. Whereas me personally, I play normally from the front outwards. And the reason for that, for me personally, is the fact that it's, it's all very well getting value. So I could turn around and tell you, I could look right now at a race card at Newbury and there could be like, I don't know, five 40 to 1 shots. I'm like, oh, that could easily be 20 to 1 on the day. But it's perfect. And you're like, right, okay, that's 20 to 1 on the day. And you're like, right, I've got 20 points of value and effect locked in. But that's still a 20 to 1 shot to win. So this is where the value versus probability comes. It's all very well getting 20 points of value locked in. But the probability, you've still got to beat the probability with a 20 to 1 shot winning the race. So again, going back to that point is if you've got, say, a 1 to 2 shot as a favourite against a 5 to 4 shot and then, like, say, two 4 to 1 shots um, and then, like, I don't know, a 16 to 1 shot, 33 to 1 in an 8 runner race. Well, because of how short the front end is, you might, again, get a 33 to 1 shot, gets clipped into 16s before the off and you're like, right, I've locked in 16 points of profit there. Obviously, um, this is me speaking if you're not a trading in and out. This is just me if you just let your bets run. So you've got 16 points of profit. And even if you're each way, you're still trying to fight against that one to two shot, the five to four shot and the four to one shots to get into that front end of the market. So you have to you have to re you have to be realistic. So if you've got a 33 to one shot, yeah, it's perfect. If you think that that has got you have to have a realistic chance of winning the race in my opinion, whether you're backing it each way or to win, whether it's 50 to one or three. I remember backing a Hoy Senor at 33 to one, but I thought he was going, he had a strong chance to win the Brown Advisory. He obviously, I think he was it second he came to La Honne Press, but I thought he had a strong chance of winning and his price was just overpriced. The same with Brave Man's game that year, 16 to one. I thought he had a strong chance. Obviously he was two to one until he got pulled. Correct Rambler in the Grand National, 33 to 1. I thought he could win the race. There is no good putting 33 to 1 shots who you think were going to be able to, they'll shorten in price because you can think they're going to shorten in price and they may go off, say, 10 to 1. And that's brilliant. You've locked in so many points of profit. So 23 points you've beat the market by. But if they're a 10 to 1 shot and there's, say, four or five horses below them that are all like 3 to 1, 5 to 1, or whatever, they've still got to beat all that lower end of the market. So it's just having a reality of it's all very well going around telling everyone you've got 100 to 1 shots that are locked in at 33 to 1 or 33 to 1 that are now 16s. You've got to have a realistic chance of winning it. Um, so again, number number five is the risk versus reward. So that's pretty much what I'm saying now is the fact of when to punch and when to duck, especially the flat with the jumps, um, is is picking your battles. You don't have to bet in every single race, whereas the punt, the bookies obviously have to put up for every single race. Right now, big lessons from Royal Ascot are that the two-year-old markets were pretty all over the shop, as were the um, the handicaps. And also from the anti-post front, if you looked at the anti-post markets for this weekend just gone at Newmarket, there was the um, Bunbury Cup at York and there was also, uh, I can't remember, the other big handicap. And the front six, so the front three in each of those that were like four to one, six to one, ten to one and stuff, both of them just got wiped. They just didn't turn up. So you're betting very, very tough markets, in my opinion, at the moment. Like that Saturday just gone, bar obviously the obvious with a few of the shorties at Newmarket, that was a bookies day built perfectly for them because you had loads of handicaps, you had loads of handicap sprints. A handicap is brilliant if you catch the horse on the day. You get rewarded so heavily with a nice price. The problem is, how many times do you have the right horse and then he gets drawn on the wrong side, the ground changes, um, he gets stuck in a pocket, a jockey, especially with the handicap sprints. I love them as a, a better medium if you can get the right one. But right now, I just don't think the form, one minute it's raining, one minute it's dry, one minute it's fast. I think if you wait a couple of weeks time, it'll all start settling down. So my point with this is the risk versus reward is the fact that you can choose your battles. You don't have to play all these races. And the other thing as well is going towards the Cheltenham Festival to why again, punching and ducking is the fact like stuff like looking at the Arkle now like and trying to decide should you have a bet? Shouldn't you have a bet? Champion hurdle. Should you have a bet or shouldn't you? Because obviously Constitution Hill, you're waiting for that information to find out, is he going over fences or is he going over hurdles? My gut instinct says he's going to stay over hurdles. Um, but if he doesn't and he goes over fences, obviously the people who have took the prices on like Marine National, Fasal Vega and stuff like that for the Arkle, they're then up against a monster who's coming over 
on, on Arkle debut, who has just destroyed the fields in on over hurdles. However, if he stays over hurdles, anything that stays over hurdles with him is going to be massively up against it. But the people that are in the Arkle and the Turners and stuff like that, they're going to be laughing because they don't have to worry about him. So this year is quite different in the fact that a lot of us have had small speculative bets, um, but you're not diving in heavily or and you haven't had the opportunity to long term plan as far as normal um, just because you don't it's the, again the risk versus reward you don't want to risk like putting a massive bet on say Marine Nationale and then obviously Henderson turns around and goes Constitution Hill is going to the Arkle as well because one you don't know if Barry Connell would just turn around and say he's going to the Champion Hurdle now I don't think that's likely me personally um, and two I don't think Constitution I think Constitution Hill will stay over hurdles um, but at the same time, you just don't know until that information comes out. So that's why a lot of people are sitting on their hands. There's a lot of horses we don't know whether they're going hurdling or chasing. If you're getting good prices on them, like so obviously if you took five or six to one on Marine National instead of like five to two, three to one, that that makes sense. And the same with if you're taking thirty three to one on a horse, thinking oh I've got a really strong theory that they're going to go hurdling again, then yeah that that's brilliant. But it's just the fact of how much do you really want to stake into it um, without the definitive information. Um, and then finally, my final one is just the different stages of the anti-post. So currently at the moment, we're in the stages of on the flat. Like obviously it was brilliant on the weekend for anyone who saw. If you read my blog or if you saw on the Discord, I put up um, City of Troy for the Epsom Derby next year at 16s and uh, 16s for the 2000 Guineas. So obviously it's three to one or four to one for those now. And that is where a lot of the, I know everyone, most people look at me and they think it's all National Hunt. But I do pride myself on trying to get these horses that I see something before, not before everyone does, but before a lot of people do. And a lot of people who do see it, they don't tend to pent that far in advance. They won't take that risk. Whereas I enjoy taking that risk. And often a lot of the time, the, the bet will be the one further down the line rather than the fact of someone taking, obviously I took six to four, but if you were taking four to six on the day, you might say, I don't want to take the four to six, but 16 to one sounds interesting. I know it's got 11 months and a lot of time underwater, but at the end of the day, that's the way you win on anti-post. So at the current stage, we're kind of in the, there's Goodwood, there's York, there's stuff like that. But we're then going to transition through into the September, October months. A lot of those, like you've already missed, like say the ARC markets and stuff like that, they're all closing up a little bit and they're all getting a lot tighter. Um, but then all the Cheltenham side of things start to open up. So you swap over September, October is a very strong time because all the stable tours start coming out. And as soon as that Henderson stable tour comes out, this is where Constitution Hill goes. Willie Mullins follows up. Fasal Vega goes here. This is there. So you have to be ready with all of those. But me personally, Going up to Christmas, that's where you get your, as I say, your base bets down. But then from December onwards, that's when you start. Once you start knowing, once you start seeing these horses entered, from September onwards, you'll see them entered, sorry, obviously from October. And then before they run, you're going to have to start taking your chances. And I know everyone, obviously my final point would be, people are saying the anti-post market's dead. It's not dead, it's just a lot, lot harder. There is no, there's no beating around the bush with that. It's a lot harder to make money. Um... It's, I think personally it's still easier to make money than betting day to day um, but it's harder to make money in the fact that obviously you're having to be one step ahead like no one wants to take the price before I remember when Sprinter Sacra won the lightning chase at Doncaster he'd come fourth in the in the Supreme Novices Spirit Son had been retired so he only had Kukar and Alfaroff ahead of him in the Supreme Market he won the lightning chase absolutely skated in and he looked phenomenal over uh, chase uh, over the fences and he was 9-1 to one after that race Whereas could you could you ever sit so I don't know looking at this year's Supreme, so that would be like I can't remember who the third horse was the McManus horse that then went on to win the Aintree Group One, so for example that would be like Fasal Vega scooting in looking phenomenal and then you looking at a market and seeing him at nine to one it just doesn't happen anymore the prices are almost halved it's massively in the bookmaker's favourite so you've almost got to say and know that Fasal Vega is going to do that, but it's just the risk you take because that's what the game is. So, I mean, I could go on all day and I could talk and talk and talk about different types of anti-post betting, um, strategies, ways to find horses, and obviously the plot, especially to Cheltenham. Like today, I'm supposed to be taking a break. First thing I've done is I've gone and found a horse I think is going to win the national. And that's just, the, that's just the way that I like. I slow down and then I just start looking at other things instead. So, yeah, I'm going to be on a break for a little bit. Um, I will still be on Twitter here and there. My messages are open, but just... Um, I'm having a break break and then I'll be back in September or whatever. I've got no idea what I'm going to do for the winter months um, so far, um, but we'll just wait and see. So uh, yeah, so enjoy the uh, summer 
And um, yeah, my DMs are open. If you've got any questions about racing or you just want to chat about or what do you think of this horse or whatever, always there to uh, chat away. So if you're not following and you haven't subscribed, you click the link below. But otherwise, enjoy your week. Cheers.